Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Asian CARP virtual information session. My name is Rebecca Schroeder, and I will be your moderator tonight. I am the Asian CARP uh, project manager at the Invasive Species Center. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that I am speaking to you today from Robinson Huron Treaty Territory, the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, home of Garden River First Nation, Batchewana First Nation, and the Metis Nation. So before we get started, um, obviously I want to welcome you and thank you all for joining us tonight. It's really great that you could be here and I'm excited to, to have you hear um, all the great stuff we have tonight, but I wanted to do a quick little poll. So I'm gonna test this out because um, I would like to, to see what everyone knows about Asian crafts before we get started. So um, while that's running and we're collecting some answers, just wanted to give you some background about the event. We typically host these events in person um, in areas around the Southern Great Lakes in Ontario, but obviously due to COVID, uh, we've had to take things virtual. So bear with us as we give this a, as a, a try. Um, but our events are typically targeted toward anglers, boaters, cottagers, and other Great Lakes users and enthusiasts or interested members of the public. So um, I know that we have a mix of people on the call today, and that's really great. So this will be an interesting poll to see um, how many how many people we, we've got on here. So I'm going to close it. So thank you. And let's share the results. So most people have some knowledge and, and we have a few with advanced and, and some beginners. So that's great. And I'm glad to have all of you here. So as I mentioned, I work for the Invasive Species Center, which is a not-for-profit organization that connects stakeholders knowledge and technology to prevent the introduction and spread of invasive species that harm Canada's environment, economy, and society. And you can visit our website at www.invasivespeciescenter.ca if you want to uh, learn more, sign up for our newsletter, bi-weekly media scan, and some event and webinar invitations. And you can also check out our asiancarp.ca website, which has a ton of great information on species profiles, um, information on risk assessments, some monitoring and early detection work, and we have our webinar series, which is really great and you should definitely check it out. So the format for tonight um, is gonna start off with a presentation from Fisheries and Oceans Canada uh, by Jennifer Cavanaugh. And then we will do some panel introductions with our really awesome panel of experts tonight that's made up of Dave Marson from Fisheries and Oceans Canada's Asian Carp Program. Uh, we have Dr. Nick Mandrak from U of T, Brooke Schreier from the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters, um, Jeff Brinsmead from the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, Greg Kinsman from Fisheries and Oceans Canada's Conservation and Protection Program, and Ashley Ray, who is a, an angler and content creator that you may know from fishylovestofish.com. So a really awesome panel. Um, and if you have any questions throughout the presentation, uh, that's obviously what the panel session is for. So I really encourage you to ask them. Um, and please type them in the question box. And if you can, it would be great if you could direct them um, to one of these lovely panelists that we have that I'm showing you right now. And um, I'll read them out loud to our panel. And if you can't think of anyone you wanna direct them to, I'll do that for you, no problem. And then the other thing is if I can't get to all your questions tonight, they are recorded. So we will be able to contact you after the event and we can follow up via email. So I will make sure your questions get answered um, even if they can't live tonight. And then lastly is the media. If there are any media personnel on the line, because we did invite some, um, it would be great if you could identify yourself when asking questions. And then we will save those for the end so we can get through the rest of the audience questions first. Um, we're also going to be playing some video clips throughout the presentations. So if you're having any difficulties hearing them and you have headphones in, um, just try removing them, plugging them back in. Um, checking your speakers. But again, if you have any technical difficulties, you can type those in the chat box or the question box as well, and I'll do my best to help you out. And oops, last but not least is there's a survey um, at the end of this presentation that would be really helpful if you could fill out so we can learn a little bit more about um, what you thought of the event and we can get some really useful information from you. And there will be some more polls throughout Jen's presentation. So um, if you answer those polls and you want to leave us with your mailing address um, in the survey, we might send you a, a swag bag, which we would typically do anyways um, if this were a live event, but we're, we're doing our best virtually. So uh, let's get started with the presentation. Um, our speaker is Jennifer Cavanaugh, formerly Wright, from Fisheries and Oceans Canada. She's a senior biologist with the Asian Carp Program, and she works out of the Burlington office. 
She's a program advisor and coordinates the program's partnership and outreach activities. And she's popped on the screen to say hello. <laughs> and uh, I'm gonna pass it over to you, Jen. Hello, everyone. And thank you very much for the introduction, Rebecca. I'm gonna shut the video cam off so that you can focus on the screen in front of you. Okay, I'm just going to test out to make sure I can move the slides. Yes, okay. So as Rebecca mentioned, we usually organize these events in communities around the Lower Great Lakes, and it's really nice to be able to gather and speak with members of the community in person. I prefer that setting, but I'm also grateful for the technology and grateful to the Invasive Species Centre to be able to bring us together virtually tonight so that myself and the expert panel members are able to bring awareness and information to you, members of the Anglin community this evening. Recognizing we may have participants tonight that are joining us from the US, I would like to point out that unless I otherwise specify, I am really only referring to the Canadian waters of the Great Lakes and Canada's position with respect to Asia carps. Aquatic invasive species are among the chief threats to the health of the Great Lakes. And Asian carps are among the top aquatic invasive species being monitored in Canada for their potential arrival into the Great Lakes. Fisheries and Oceans Canada takes these threats very seriously and we're committed to responding quickly and effectively. We will continue to work with domestic and US partners to prevent the invasion of Asian carps, but each Canadian, especially those of us that enjoy being on or around the water who are more likely to spot these species also need to be vigilant and can play a role in stopping these harmful invaders. So with that, I'm gonna pass it back over to Rebecca. She is gonna run a few polling questions uh, for you to participate in. So there's four questions and um, a lot of these questions come from uh, questions we frequently get when we when we host these events. So I've got four of them. The first one is how many different types or species of Asian carps are there? And there's only one right answer. Okay, the results are great. Most of you got the correct answer. The number is four. So the next question. Just bear with me I'm trying to pull it up. There we go. Is common carp considered an Asian carp? Very good. The correct answer is no. And uh, it looks like almost all of you got that, correct. So the next question, are there easy ways to tell the difference between the Asian carp species and other common fishes found in Ontario? Yes or no? Perfect, that's great to see. The answer is yes. And I'm gonna go over some of those differences later on in the, in the talk tonight. So the fourth and final question, are any of the Asian carp species already established in Canada? Okay, so the, the correct answer is no. 
Um, but it is interesting to see uh, how many yes um, answers we got. So um, uh, we are going to talk about that uh, in a few slides from now. So I'll, I'll uh, discuss it then. So I'm just going to try and take back control here. So the Asian carps is the term we use to collectively refer to four species. The four species you see on the screen are big head carp, silver carp, grass carp, and black carp. These four species pose a significant threat to the Great Lakes Basin, including connected waterways and aquatic ecosystems. All four species reach similar massive sizes with black carp being the largest of the four capable of reaching 90 kilograms or 200 pounds and well over a meter in length. And silver carp is the one that you may be most familiar with from YouTube videos for its jumping behavior, ability to reach heights of three meters above the water, posing a safety hazard for boaters. They all eat different things, so they pose different threats to the food web. Big head carp eat zooplankton, silver carp eat phytoplankton, grass carp eat aquatic plants, and black carp feed on mollusks. All four species consume very large amounts of food, roughly 20 to 40% of their body weight every day, out competing our native fishes. You'll note that common carp is not on the screen. And although common carp is invasive and also native to Asia and Europe, they are not one of the species we collectively refer to as Asian carps. This video that Rebecca is about to show introduces you to the threat of Asian carps and features perspectives of people who love being on and around the water. It's just over a minute in length. Canada's Great Lakes are under threat from dangerous invaders. My name is Terry Reese. I'm the executive director of the Federation of Ontario Cottagers Associations. One of the top issues for our members is the introduction of invasive species, and Asian carps is public enemy number one. People need to understand this is four species that can completely disrupt their experience at the water's edge. It's going to be nasty. I'm Tim Purdy. I'm a commercial fisherman. Our family's been fishing the waters of Lake Huron for 118 years. I truly believe if the Asian carp come into the Great Lakes, the commercial fishery will be dead within three years. My name is Francis Lavallee. I'm from Nawash, First Nation. I've been working as a commercial fisherman all my life. My father was a fisherman. His father was a fisherman. Every time I go out and see a fish come up, I get the same charge I got the first time. If we don't have our fish, it would be devastating, not only for me, but for my children and their children. Part of our culture will disappear. My name is Adrian Bartlett, and I love sport fishing. I spend a lot of time on the water with my family and with my friends, and it's a bonding experience for us. Asian carp really scares me. I've seen videos of them jumping into boats. They're known to injure people. It's very sobering to think that that could happen in Canada. It would affect the whole ecosystem. I mean, they're voracious eaters, and the whole food web could collapse. The introduction of these fish is going to be a menace. You can't boat, you can't fish, you can't swim. It's horrible. I was lucky as a kid to be able to enjoy these waterfronts, and I want my kids and grandkids to be able to experience it too. So I wasn't able to hear that video myself. I, myself, I really hope everyone else uh, joining us could hear that. Um, and I hope you can hear me now. I'm gonna take back control here.
So whether you're a cottager or a camper, a commercial fisher, a recreational or sport fisher, a paddler or a bird watcher, being able to spot an Asian carp and know that it may be one of the four species can make a big difference. Learning to tell them apart from common fishes we have in Ontario is important. All four species of Asian carps have a narrow dorsal fin located relatively centered on their backs. They also have no barbels. Barbels are like whiskers at the corners of the fish's mouth. Silver carp and big head carp have a very low set eye in their head, making them look like they are upside down. We don't have any fish that look like this in Ontario or the Great Lake waters. Both silver carp and big head carp are silvery in color, with big head carp having blotchy gray spots on their body. Grass carp and black carp have their eye set in the middle of their head, and they both have large scales with a crosshatch pattern with black carp being the blackish brown color and grass carp being olive brown on the back with lighter sides blending to white below. All four species of Asian carps are native to Asia. River systems from southern China, north into eastern Russia, to northern Vietnam. Asian carps were originally introduced to the southern US in the late 1960s and the 70s to stock aquaculture facilities and ponds for use as water quality control agents for pests and aquatic plants. Flooding events allowed them to escape from these facilities and ponds and human activities such as live bait releases and the construction of man-made canals are also responsible for the introduction of Asian carps to the lower Mississippi River Basin. Big head and silver carps were also introduced as a result of live food fish industry. This map that you see, courtesy of the US Geological Survey, shows the movement and spread of Asian carps in the US over a 50 year period from 1968 to 2018. It shows just how quickly these species are able to adapt and spread. There are reproducing populations of all four Asian carps throughout the Mississippi River Basin, and they are quickly moving towards the Great Lakes Basin. They are literally at our doorstep. Overall, the most likely entry points to the Great Lakes for Asian carps is through the Chicago area waterway system, which Lake Michigan flows into. However, there are two rivers, the Sandusky and the Maumee Rivers, located in the western basin of Lake Erie in the US that have confirmed grass carp reproduction. This area of Lake Erie represents the current most likely entry point for grass carp. These two maps show just how suitable our Canadian aquatic habitats are for Asian carps. The map on the left shows that of 79 Canadian Great Lakes tributaries studied, 57 of them have suitable spawning conditions for Asian carps. The tributaries in the study were assessed based on multiple parameters such as the presence or absence of barriers, the length of the river before barrier, the average flow of the river, and the average temperature. In relation to grass carp, the map on the right uses climate variables like temperature and precipitation from the native range of Asian carps to show how suitable our aquatic habitats are using a colored index. The deeper red color indicates a stronger suitability while the lighter yellow and white colored areas show weaker suitability levels. As you can see from this map, the entire Great Lakes Basin and most of Canada is dark red in color, indicating a strong habitat match and thus greater suitability for grass carp. Overall, the risk assessments have shown that enough food and habitat exist throughout all five of the Great Lakes, especially Lake Erie, for these invasive fishes to survive and overwinter. So why should we care? Asian carps are highly adaptable. They dominate habitats and outcompete native fishes for resources that are required in all life stage, stages of our native fishes. Asian carps have a voracious appetite. They are eating machines, capable of consuming enormous amounts of aquatic plants, 
phytoplankton, zooplankton, as well as mussels, snails, freshwater shrimp, crayfish, and insects, all of which our native fishes need for food. Asian carps are also prolific breeders with females capable of producing over a million eggs in a spawning season, and in turn, thousands of offspring each year. When you consider both their feeding and their spawning behaviors, Asian carps will dominate habitats. In US rivers where Asian carps are established, they make up as much as 80% of the biomass, outnumbering native fishes 10 to one and rendering those ecosystems fragile. So you might be wondering, how will this affect me, you, whether you are a rec or a commercial fisher? The establishment of Asian carps could have very damaging and long lasting impacts on recreational and commercial fishing and water users in general. It will result in increased competition for resources, reducing the food and habitat available for sport or commercially targeted fish populations. It will result in decline of native fish species diversity and biomass, resulting in a lot less fish to catch by rec or sport fishers and causing decreased revenues for commercial harvesters through lower catches and quotas. It will result in increased operational costs of commercial fishing by causing commercial fishers to travel further distances to catch fish, thereby reducing their profits. It will also result in potential danger to recreational water users from silver carp jumping out of the water and damaging boats and other equipment, as well as causing injury to humans. Of the four species of Asian carps, grass carp currently represents the most immediate threat to Canadian waters. There have been no captures or recorded sightings of silver carp, big head carp, or black carp in Canadian waters since the program began in 2012-2013. However, very low numbers of grass carp have been captured in Canadian waters of Lakes Erie, Ontario and Huron, and even though there is confirmed spawning on the U.S. side of Lake Erie, there is no evidence grass carp are spawning or are established in Canadian waters. While the finding of grass carp in Canadian waters is cause for concern, to reiterate, there is no evidence that these fish reproduced. For an establishment to occur, we would need to see evidence of grass carp spawning in Canadian waters and for their offspring to have survived here over more than one winter. Proof of, the, of an establishment would take the form of consecutive years of capturing newly hatched grass carp, which we know were born in Canadian waters. So what does this mean? It means the time to act is right now. All it takes is as few as 10 mature females and 10 or fewer mature males to achieve greater than 50% chance of annual successful spawning. That's not very many fish. Grass carp eat up to 40% of their body weight in plants every day, which produces huge amounts of waste. This waste can lead to algae blooms that negatively impact water quality and pose a threat to human health and safety. Juvenile grass carp feed on multiple micro and macro invertebrates and small fish. They directly compete with our native fishes for food, ultimately starving our native fishes. Adult grass carp feed primarily on aquatic plants that is located in the shallow nearshore habitats of waterways. This would have a significant impact on habitat quality as more than 50% of our native fish community use these nearshore vegetation zones to support important life stages such as spawning, refuge, and feeding. I would also like to point out that when plant material is not available, grass carp will also eat insects, small fish, and other invertebrates. So thus, by cons consuming aquatic plants, grass carp would cause devastating impacts, such as disturbing lake and river bottoms, destroying valuable wetlands, increasing murkiness of the water, making it difficult for native fishes to find food, leading, leaving native juvenile fishes without adequate cover from predators and reducing spawning habitats. This image on the screen 
represents a healthy and balanced ecosystem. You can see a diverse fish community, water, water quality that appears good and clear. There is multiple species of aquatic plants. The shoreline has plants and you see birds and amphibians using the habitats. In contrast, this image shows you what a degraded ecosystem looks like, representing the negative impacts of grass carp. From a broader ecological perspective, the introduction of grass carp into Canadian waters would have devastating impacts on not only the fishing industry, but would also have significant impacts on the green spaces adjacent to these waterways by destroying and degrading wetlands, which are home to a multitude of bird, mammal, as well as reptile and amphibian species. There are hundreds of bird species that use wetland habitats as refuge and nesting habitat, and bird enthusiasts use places like Long Point Bay and Point Pelee as places to go to see migratory birds that are unique or rare in this area. The degradation of wetlands would negatively impact these species and possibly reduce the likelihood of seeing them all together. It has been estimated that eight out of 47 Canadian Great Lakes bird species may experience high negative consequences, such as the canvasback and least bittern. The decrease in water quality due to grass carp would have catastrophic effects on a multitude of areas. Algae blooms can become toxic to swimmers who come into contact with algae, as well as pose a great threat to dogs and other pets that come in contact with or drink the water. The decrease in water quality can also make it more difficult for our water treatment plants to properly treat effectively the water we drink. The red high alert areas you see on the map are where grass carp have been captured or have a high potential to be seen or caught. However, it's important to point out that all of our waterways in the Great Lakes Basin have potential to have grass carp either swimming through or hanging out. Since 2012, 2013, 29 grass carp have been captured in the Canadian waters of the Great Lakes. Of those 29 fish, the majority were sterile, so they were unable to reproduce. Although there have been 29 captures, most of these are a result of single captures or incidents. Please note these high alert areas, and if you fish these spots, please keep a lookout for grass carp. So if nothing is done, if no action is taken, yes, to answer the question on the screen, over the next five to 10 years, it is highly likely that grass carp will spread to other lakes from their point of introduction or release. The modeling results displayed in this figure show the spread of grass carp over a 50 year period if individuals were to be introduced into Southern Lake Erie via the Maume River. The spread into Lake Ontario would likely take longer than in Lake Erie as Lake Erie offers extremely suitable spawning conditions where individual grass carp would likely stay before spreading to Lake Ontario. It is worth noting, however, that the entire shoreline of Lake Ontario will be visited or occupied even though it doesn't appear that way in the figures due to the depth of Lake Ontario in comparison to Lake Erie because the near shore shallower area of Lake Erie is larger than for Lake Ontario, which makes it easier to visualize in the, fig in the figure. Similar modeling was done for other points of introduction and found that due to suitable spawning conditions, it is anticipated that spread of grass carp would also be more rapid in Lakes Michigan, Huron, and potentially Lake Superior. The development of the Asian carp program was a key outcome of the binational ecological risk assessment of big-headed carps for the Great Lakes. Given the high risk of Asian carp introduction and consequences, in May 2012, an Asian carp program was announced by the Government of Canada with a goal to protect the integrity of the Great Lakes Basin by preventing the arrival, establishment and spread of all four Asian carp species. Since the inception of the program, our team has been working diligently with U.S. partners to protect the Great Lakes from these highly invasive freshwater fishes. 
Fisheries and Oceans Canada also has a significant and very successful collaboration and partnership with the province of Ontario's Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, as both agencies have a joint responsibility for aquatic invasive species in the Canadian waters of the Great Lakes. The program is designed to monitor and manage all four species and was built on four core pillars, prevention, early warning, response, and management. This evening, I'm gonna focus more on the first three pillars of the program. Prevention is the first pillar of the program. It focuses on preventing the threat of Asian carps from entering Canadian waters through public outreach, education and awareness. The prevention pillar also covers risk assessment and research. To help prevention efforts, the Asian Carp Program partnered with several organizations who specialize in natural resource and invasive species outreach and education. You might wonder why partner? Well, because partners have shared goals. It allows us to efficiently use and leverage our resources and avoid overlap and create consistent messaging. It also allows us to leverage strengths. NGOs are well-placed with established audiences so we can reach and engage with more people. Partners to date include the Invasive Species Centre, Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters, Federation of Ontario Cottagers Associations, Toronto and Region Conservation Authority, the Toronto Zoo, and the Royal Ontario Museum. Beginning in 2013, Fisheries and Oceans Canada and its partners conducted broad outreach efforts to engage the Canadian public to the threats posed, as well as the research and preventative efforts being made. A few highlights include, in 2015, AsianCarp.ca was launched through a partnership between Fisheries and Oceans Canada and the Invasive Species Centre. In 2016, an Asian carp exhibit was opened by the Royal Ontario Museum. And in 2018, the Toronto Zoo opened a live Asian carp exhibit where juvenile black carp, grass carp, and big head carp were displayed live as a permanent exhibit. This is a great opportunity for people to see them in person and be, and be better able to recognize them if you ever encounter them in the wild. A very important part of our collective outreach efforts is helping communities learn how to identify grass carp. This slide features a section from a newly released grass carp identification fact sheet that can be found online at asiancarp.ca and invadingspecies.com. Based on calls into the, invading, into the invading species hotline, there are a few common fishes that are often misidentified and reported as grass carp. Those are fall fish, sucker species, such as white sucker you see in the screen, and smallmouth buffalo. As you can see on the left-hand side of the slide, the grass carp has a short dorsal fin, large scales, and the eyes are low and sit in line with their mouth. Whereas fall fish has moderate size scales and their eyes sit relatively high on the head. In the center of the slide, grass carp are described as having a jawed mouth, whereas the white sucker in the picture has a sucker mouth and the eyes sit high on the head, not low in line with the mouth. On the right side of the slide, you see the grass carp has a slender head and body, and compared with buffalo species, their body is quite deep in comparison. This is a short one minute video clip that features how to identify a grass carp and tell them apart from another invasive and commonly misidentified species, the common carp. Grass carp are often confused with common carp. So this is a juvenile grass carp, approximately 30 centimeters in length, but they do reach up to a meter and a half in length. And while this guy's under a pound in weight, they do reach up to 90 pounds. Grass carp has a terminal mouth, which means it ends right at the end of its head, not facing down, not facing up, but just right off the end. This fish does not have any barbels at the side of the mouth. The scales have a darkening on the, the back of the scale, which actually creates kind of a crosshatch pattern on the side of the fish. Now, when most people observe these fish, they're gonna see them from above. And how we distinguish between the common carp and the grass carp is with the common carp, the dorsal fin would start approximately where my thumb is here and run back to here, where it's much shorter with the grass carp. So the grass carp has the short dorsal fin, 
Common carp has a long one. And that's the easiest way to really tell them apart when they're in the water. Our team takes every report seriously and we act upon it. We have a chance to make a difference here. There's only a few fish out there and we want to get them early and get them out of the system. So every set of eyes on the water really helps this effort. This chart shows that it costs less to prevent the introduction of aquatic invasive species than to delay action and manage them once they are established. Preventing the introduction of a species is the action that costs the least. If action is delayed until after the entry of a species, then costs rise according to the amount of time taken to action, to act. As time passes and the species reproduces and spreads, Managing the invasion of a species becomes more difficult. The relationship between the stages of species invasion and costs to respond to the invasion is illustrated through this invasion curve. If action is delayed until after the species has become established and has spread, then the impacts must be managed and the species invasion is at its peak. A good example of a species that is at this point, its peak is sea lamprey. It costs far less to prevent an aquatic invasive species from entering an area than to control it afterwards. Costs rise when it becomes necessary to eradicate a species, prevent its spread, control or manage its impact once established. Swift detection and action are critical to keep a species from becoming established. We are at the bottom of the curve right now for Asian carp, in particular grass carp. We have time to make a difference. To prevent introduction, the Asian carp program implements an early detection surveillance program alongside partners, including the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry and the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority, with the objective of finding any Asian carps that may be present and remove them safely. Early detection surveillance serves two goals. One, to target high-risk sites to detect and remove Asian carps, and two, to collect baseline fish community data so we know what the fish community should look like without Asian carps. So if they ever do arrive, we can properly assess the impact. Searching for and finding these species may be present in, that are present in very low numbers, I'm sure you can imagine, is like trying to find a needle in a haystack. The larger map shows the early detection surveillance sites that are generally sampled each year from May to November since the surveillance work began in 2013. These sites are based on modeling of tributaries that have suitable spawning conditions. That's the smaller map shown on the left uh, hand side of the screen that was covered in an earlier slide. There are up to 37 locations in Lakes Ontario, Huron, Erie, the Huron-Erie corridor and Superior that program crews are visiting and using up to nine different traditional gear types to detect and capture Asian carps. At these sites, they are electrofishing and setting nets in river mouths, slightly upriver in near shore areas and in large wetlands. As I've mentioned, Preventing invasive species from ever arriving is ideal and most cost effective, but prevention can't stop everything. So we need to be able to detect these fish early and remove them quickly before they have a chance to reproduce and establish a population. That is why we respond. So what do we mean by response? Well, it is any immediate steps or actions taken to help reduce or eliminate the threat. And partnering is key. Problems can spread jurisdictional boundaries quickly, so it's best to share warnings, information, and techniques. To date, our program has been focused on responding to the detection of Asian carps in the Great Lakes, specifically grass carp. As I mentioned earlier, since the program began in 2012-2013, 29 grass carp have been detected in Canadian waters of the Great Lakes. 
These fish have come to us from a variety of sources. Our early detection surveillance, commercial fishermen, reports from anglers and citizens like yourself, and monitoring projects run by the Toronto Region Conservation Authority. To give you a sense on how few grass carp there are out there, there were no captures of grass carp last year, and only one grass carp captured this year, and that was in July through our early detection surveillance activities. Grass carp have been and still are stocked in some US states, and some states require the fish be sterilized before release. So there are a mix of both fertile and sterile fish out there. Once we know whether the fish can reproduce, we, better, we can better understand the level of threat and can respond accordingly. Even though a sterile fish can have an impact over its lifetime, a fertile fish poses a much bigger threat, and therefore our response actions reflect that. Testing to determine whether a grass carp is fertile or sterile is the first piece of information we collect as soon as the fish is in our possession. Once this testing is complete, we proceed with full dissection. We send one otolith, which is the fish's ear bone, for oxygen isotope analysis that can tell us the broad region that the fish originated from. The other otolith is sent for microchemistry analysis that we hope to match up with microchemical signatures of waters around the Great Lakes so we can better understand where the fish has been hanging out. We also age the fish by its scales and or vertebra. Other tissues we collect are fin clips for genetic analysis, stomach contents for diet, and a muscle plug for contaminants analysis. So as you can see, we can learn a lot about the grass carp that are captured and reported. So it's very important to know how to identify and report these species. It really does help us by informing bigger picture management decisions, but it also helps us decide on immediate actions in terms of our response. This final video clip, just over a minute in length, features one of the biologists in the Asian carp program that does the fertility testing and dissection work in our Asian carp lab. The Asian carp lab is really the command center for responding to detections of Asian carps in the Great Lakes. And all of the information we can collect on these fish is done in this lab here. My name is Julia Colm. I'm an aquatic biologist with Fisheries and Oceans Canada's Asian carp program. My main role is conducting fertility testing on the specimens and then doing a full dissection to get as much information from every individual as we can to help better understand where these fish are coming from. Asian carp pose a huge threat to our Great Lakes ecosystems. They can reproduce really quickly, multiple times per year they produce a huge number of eggs at any given time. And the very first thing that happens when one is captured is it comes back to the lab and we do fertility testing. And if it is fertile, we're going to follow up with operations on the water. You want to detect them early and remove them quickly to prevent the species from having the chance to reproduce and establish a population. I feel a lot of pride knowing that I'm part of a team that's protecting not only the Great Lakes, but the inland waters beyond as well. Our team. So the responsibility for taking action with regard to Asian carps is shared between Fisheries and Oceans Canada and Ontario's Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. Detections of a live Asian carp triggers the instant command system led by Fisheries and Oceans Canada and the Ministry will participate in responses necessary. Our response plan is based on the instant command system and the system allows for a common hierarchy and command structure, a 
standard consistent terminology so everyone is speaking the same language, a communication protocol so everyone knows who to speak to and when for updates or briefings, and it also allows for flexibility to adjust. People cease being people and become boxes with defined roles. This allows other agencies to slot into the structure as needed. The response plan has trigger levels. So for Asian carps, it is based on fertility results, species captured, the number of them captured, and their life stages. A coordinated response may involve conducting additional surveillance efforts. So we would redirect some of our crews from other locations to that new location. And it could include electrofishing, netting, and or eDNA sampling. We are constantly striving to improve response actions and continue to update protocols based on the experience we gain through past responses and exercises. Throughout the program's history, Fisheries and Oceans Canada has worked closely with provincial and U.S. counterparts to support control and prevention activities, provide scientific support, expertise, and assistance with field training and exercises. Specifically, in 2012, Canada and Ontario formally announced their participation, a formal partnership in the US-led Asian Carp Regional Coordinating Committee, established to ensure coordinated and effective action among federal, state, and local agencies to keep Asian carps from establishing in the Great Lakes. In 2015, new aquatic invasive species regulations under the Federal Fisheries Act in Canada came into force. These regulations provide a national re regulatory framework to help prevent intentional and unintentional introductions of aquatic invasive species in Canada from other countries, across provincial and territorial borders, and between ecosystems within a region. These aquatic invasive species regulations include prohibitions against specific species, including prohibitions against the importation, possession, transportation, or release of Asian carps unless eviscerated. We also work on pathway management with a focus on the live trade pathway. The program provides identification training and supplies for shipment inspections and we assist with analysis of seized specimens. So whether you are fishing, kayaking, walking along the shore, or just hanging out, on your dock, you can make a difference by reporting these fish if you spot them. Tips from the public are essential. The more people we have out there, the more eyes on the water, the better chance we have finding and removing these species. We all have a role to play. If you see or catch a grass carp, please report it. Steps to take if you catch one are, first, do not throw it back in the water. Try your best to identify and confirm that it is indeed a grass carp. And you can do this by checking out the new grass carp identification sheet I referred to earlier. If you're confident you have a grass carp, take a photo and note your location. Report the fish by calling the invading species hotline or visit edmaps.org slash Ontario or email info at invadingspecies.com. Again, do not release the grass carp alive. Kill the fish without damaging the head or eyes. Gut the fish and keep it in a cooler with its head above the ice, preferably wrapped in a damp paper towel. We will arrange to pick up the fish as soon as possible. If you're looking for more information on Asian carps, please visit Fisheries and Oceans Canada's Asian carp web pages. There's profile pages there. Or visit asiancarp.ca to learn more. And don't forget, there is a panel of experts with a very wide range of experience and expertise standing by to answer all your great questions. However, if after tonight you have questions, you're welcome to direct those questions to the Invasive Species Centre or to myself or Alex Price with the Asian Carp Program. Our email addresses are provided at the bottom of the screen. Thank you again for joining us this evening, and I'd like to thank the Invasive Species Centre for organizing and hosting this event for us tonight. With that, I will pass it back to Rebecca to introduce our panel.
Thank you so much, Jen. That was a really great presentation. Um, very informative. So now it's time for our um, panel discussion, the Q&A. So I'm going to give our panel uh, a second to pop on with their webcams so that you can put faces to the, the names and the voices. Um, and then once we get everyone, I'll let everyone do a quick intro. And I'll probably just go in the order that you see uh, on my slide. One, two, three, four, five, six. OK, we've got everyone. Um, so let's start uh, with, with Dave. You want to introduce yourself? Caught me off guard. Okay. Sorry. Uh, sorry, I was looking at the uh, the videos, not the uh, the list below. So my name is uh, David Marson. I'm a senior biologist with the Foes Asian Carp Program, and I help to coordinate the uh, early detection surveillance uh, component of the program, as well as our response activities. So uh, thank you very much for having me tonight. Thanks, Dave. Nick. Hello, everyone. I'm a professor at the University of Toronto Scarborough in the Department of Biological Sciences, and I conduct research uh, uh, that focuses on the prevention and control of Asian carps. Thank you, Nick. Brooke? Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Brooke Schreier. I'm the Aquatic Program Specialist with the Invading Species Awareness Program out of the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters. Uh, I've been with the program for about five years now, and if you're not aware, the uh, ISAP program started in 1992 as a partnership between the OFAH and the MNRF, and as part of my role, I actually participate in uh, some of the early detection of, of Asian carps through answering the invading species hotline. Um, so if you call 1-800-563-7711, you very well may speak to me. Um, so really, to participate in the Asian carp program, we, you know, at, at the OFAH work uh, towards the first two pillars through prevention, so education and outreach, and then through early warning through the, the means that Jen did a really good job highlighting, uh, like the invading species hotline and uh, the early detection and distribution mapping system. Thanks, Brooke. Uh, next is Greg. Well, I think we may have lost. <laughs> You're back. I hit the wrong button there. Uh... My name is uh, Greg Kinsman. I am a fish officer with the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. And I'm also the field supervisor for a unit uh, focused on aquatic species in Canada. And I want to mention also uh, my supervisor, Ron Beerns. He is the detachment supervisor for Ontario. Thanks, Greg. Uh, next is Jeff. Hi, Jeff Brinsmead. Um, I'm the Senior Invasive Species Biologist at the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, and I'm based in uh, Peterborough, Ontario. Thank you. And last but not least, Ashley. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Ashley Ray, and I am a year-round multi-species angler. Um, not only am I very passionate about fishing, it's also how I make a living. I write articles and make videos and I, you know, have partnered with the Invasive Species Center over the last couple of years. So uh, this is a very important topic to me as someone who is so involved in the fishing space and uh, happy you guys can join us. Thank you and thanks to all of you for uh, being on our panel and joining us tonight. So um, some of you may know that as you registered, we did allow you to ask questions in advance. So um, I'm gonna get to some of those as well and then please feel free to submit any now in the question box and um, reference this nice slide I did up with our panel of experts so that you can uh, direct your questions. So let's get started. Um, the first one we had come in through registration, I'm gonna direct to Nick and it is, will Lake Superior support Asian carp and um, would it be too cold? Well, it certainly wouldn't be too cold. Um, I know even before uh, conducting the risk assessment on Asian carps in Canada that in the 1990s I was sampling a lake in Siberia that had silver carp and, and grass carp and that, that lake got a meter of ice on it in the winter. So uh, even, though, even though they're known as Asian carps, we have to keep in mind that, that Asia includes Siberia and uh, that they are found in very cold climates within their native range. So uh, Jen showed in her presentation a, a, ma a map of the predicted potential distribution of grass carp in North America that clearly showed that it could go all the way to Alaska. So um, I, I, I don't think there's any uncertainty 
uh, that uh, uh, that Asian carps could survive and and reproduce in Lake Superior. Great. Thank you, Nick. Um, the next question I'm going to give to Dave, um, and then maybe Nick too. So this one came in through registration. What would you say are the major current gaps in Canadian biosecurity measures for aquatic invaders like Asian carps? Uh, that's a challenging one. Um, I would say with regards to Asian carps, we've, we've actually done a very good job, I think, of dealing with some of the, um, the biosecurity measures. So uh, with the implementation of the National Aquatic Invasion Species Regulations under the Fisheries Act in 20. 15, um, it's actually now illegal to import um, Asian carps live. They have to be eviscerated. Um, so it's illegal to import, possess, trade, or release any of the four species of Asian carps in, uh, in Canada. Uh, um, and Dave Bros. I, I, I can I can pick up from there. <laughs> Just some technical difficulties. The Canada Border Services Agency to help with uh, you know dealing with any. Okay, thanks, Dave. I'll let. Sorry, is it working? Or you're cutting out a little bit. Um, it maybe it's just because you're also sharing your um your webcam. So if if you're having any issues, you can always just turn your webcam off and then that might that might go better but I think we okay. got most of it so uh Nick did you have anything you wanted to add to that one yes uh so Dave was talking about the legislation that we have and and the heightened awareness of Asian carps and, and I think that's a good thing and and we're probably doing better with Asian carps than some other uh invasive species uh, so where I would could see some potential gaps, um, one would be uh, surveillance, surveillance at the border and whether or not it's, you know, 100% surveillance. And then the other issue is, uh, is the more difficult one, and that is um, there, there, there's, no, um, uh, the, the, there's no physical border in the Great Lakes. So we know that grass carp are reproducing in Lake Erie. And can and can readily cross into Canada, um, and the uh, the invasive species legislation really doesn't address that. Uh, but the uh, the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement could. There's a an annex, uh, an invasive aquatic invasive species annex, Annex Six, that that uh, could address that. But I think we are not living up. Neither country is living up to the the um, uh, the intent of the agreement uh, as it relates to aquatic invasive species. I think the real issue is it, it, with the Great Lakes Basin, we have two countries, eight states, and a province. And what happens in one jurisdiction has ramifications for the entire basin, right? So, what happens in, for example, Ohio, where grass carp are reproducing, is outside of the control of Canada, yet there's going to be an impact, impact uh, to Canada. And I think that's where we have, uh, that's probably the most significant gap in, in biosecurity as it relates to Asian carps, at least in the Great Lakes Basin. Okay, thank you, Nick. Um, the next question has come in through the chat I'm gonna pick. I'm gonna try and pick and choose so that I do a little mix because we do have a lot of questions. Um, so again, if I don't get to all of them tonight, we will follow up with you by email. Um, I think I'll probably give this one to Dave. <laughs> Sorry, Dave. Are there any sterile carp acoustically, acoustically tagged and released to track their movements throughout the water courses to ground truth to any hypotheses and or modeling efforts? Um, and there was another similar question along those same lines. So I figured this is a good way to, to answer both. If Dave is here. Okay, and I, uh, I dropped in my video in the hopes that this will work a little better. Uh, can you guys hear Sounds me? Good. Yep. Yeah, okay. Um, so yeah, we, uh, I mean, we, we currently do not have any tagging efforts that are going on um, in Canadian waters. Mm -hmm. There are efforts that are um, occurring uh, through Ohio uh, Department of Natural Resources and Michigan DNR. And so they are um, tagging grass carp and 
tracking movements and, and trying to learn about um, you know what where these fish are going and when and and gather information um, with regards to their movements. So there there are uh, acoustically tagged fish out there. Um, it's not a, a, a project that that DFO is um, currently engaged in, um, and it's uh, yeah. So there 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 is uh, work ongoing, but uh, not not by DFO. Sounds good. Thank you, Dave. Um, next question is for Brooke. What species do you get reports of most often um, as a grass carp that isn't? Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Uh, that's a good question. And, you know, it's something that comes up quite a lot, obviously, with, with our role in, in vetting reports coming in from the public. Uh, as you can expect, a lot of the time there's misidentifications of, of native species. So I think Jen did a really good job highlighting some of those more, more common species that are misidentified. Uh, number one is common carp. That's That always seems to be the number one candidate that gets misidentified every single year. It's always the leader. Um, beyond that, I'd say this year in particular, we had a lot of reports of fall fish, um, which again is in, in the fact sheet that Jen highlighted in her presentation. So um, Becca, I believe that you've uh, distributed that, that fact sheet as a handout. I'm going to. If I'm not mistaken. You're going to. Okay, that's great. Mm -hmm. So participants in this call can refer to that fact sheet after after this, you know, panel and actually take a look and see some of those key uh, characteristics that you know Jen did show in our presentation. Um, so yeah, fall fish, common carp, white sucker. Surprisingly, uh, there's some definite you know differences in the morphology of the mouth there. Uh, but oftentimes, you know, uh, as we know, when you when you're out on the water looking at fish. Oftentimes you're looking at the top of the fish, so you might not see that mouth, but if you are capturing it and, and you find something with a sucker mouth, you should know that it's not one of the four uh, Asian carp species. Besides that, uh, gizzard shad is another one that gets uh, misidentified. Um, you know, they're, they're kind of a deep bodied silver fish uh, that will sometimes jump out of the water uh, in large, large groups. So people see fish jumping out of the water. And, you know, they've seen the videos online on YouTube of the silver carp jumping out of the water. So then they think, oh, well, maybe that's that's a silver carp. Um, and just for the record, we do really appreciate every single report that comes in, right? Because every time somebody reports an Asian carp to us, regardless of species, it gives us an opportunity to educate those people and, and receive those photographs, have that conversation and let them know, like, you know, thank you very much for, for sending that in. And here's some education. Here's here's some information. And. Uh, next time you catch one, if if you know it's a little bit different than the, the one that you caught this time, um, look for those key characteristics and and report it. Right. So those are those are probably some of the the top four species that get misidentified. Besides that, there's some other ones like uh, creek chub, um, uh, members of the buffalo species uh, are other ones that get uh, misidentified. Just a, a large fish, uh, deep bodied, large scales. So typically people will think will associate that with one of the Asian carps, like grass carp. Awesome. Thank you, Brooke. Um, the next question yeah. is for Jeff. Um, what capacity are, not you specifically, but I think Ontario, uh, using eDNA for screening of Asian carps? I think you're muted, Jeff. Right, I was. Sorry about that. Uh, so that's, that's most of what uh, MNRF is um, is concentrating on for doing our surveillance is that we are uh, doing eDNA surveillance. Uh, we primarily are doing that in Lake Erie, its tributaries, and the southern portion of Lake Huron. Um, although we do do some eDNA surveillance in uh, Lake Ontario as well, and opportunistically in the St. Lawrence River, especially uh, closer to the Quebec border. Uh, at, where Quebec has found uh, a couple of grass carps in the past. Um, so that, that's kind of where we are doing it, um, the, where we collect our field samples. And then those are all shipped to uh, our genetics lab uh, at Trent University, uh, where they're analyzed by a team led by uh, Dr. Chris Wilson, who is an MNRF scientist. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, the next question that we have is for Ashley. Um, this one says, what have your experiences been with invasive fish? Um, have you ever caught one in Ontario or otherwise? And you got a little shout out, they love your, your content. 
Um, and how have invasive species impacted your job so far? Uh, first of all, thank you so much. Um, I can happily say that I have not had any experiences with invasive species and um, because of the work of all these fine people here, I hope that that will continue. And, uh, you know, I just think that as anglers, we should all be aware, learn how to identify and just become as educated as possible so that uh, we can just all work on this together. So to answer the question, thankfully, I have not seen any. And uh, aside from at the Toronto Zoo exhibit, um, but that's it. So I'm really happy to say that. Thank you. Uh, the next question has come in through registration for Greg. What type of enforcement work are you currently working on that's related to Asian carps? Yes, thank you very much for the question. Um, basically, the unit that, uh, that I'm in, uh, we're staffed for three fisher officer positions. Um, it's a new unit. So uh, currently we have uh, two positions, myself and one other. We're hoping to get the, uh, the third staff in the coming months. However, the things that we're looking at is um, working with our partners, uh, both provincially, internationally, and nationally. So working with the TSA orders to help with border inspections, working with the province. Um, we're doing inspections in uh, food, aquarium, and water garden aid. So looking at things being imported into Canada, um, and as well, uh, the, uh, looking at in terms of Asian carp, there are a number of prohibitions um, in terms of possession uh, and transportation. So we enforce uh, those regulations. Thanks. Uh, next question is for Dave. If Asian carp are in the Great Lakes, what precautions are being made for them? not to enter smaller bodies of water in land lakes? Yeah, um, so the focus for us really has been in, um, you know, developing a strong early detection surveillance program. So getting out there and, and searching the waters where we would expect these species to show up in the first place um, and making sure that we're removing them quickly before they have an opportunity to reproduce or um, you know, to become established in Canadian water. So uh, the early detection and then our response protocols, um, we have those in place to, to try and stop them, uh, you know, again, from becoming established in Canadian waters and, and expanding their um, range. And then, uh, as I mentioned, or was trying to mention earlier, I'm not sure exactly where I got cut off, but we do have regulations in place as well to um, you know, stop the, the transport of live Asian carps in, in Canada. So there's a, a number of different efforts that are uh, on the go to try and make sure they don't get the chance to move into any smaller water bodies. Awesome. Thank you, Dave. Um, the next question is for Nick. Um, where did it go? So it's a two-part question, but um, Jen, I know, answered the second part in her in her presentation. But I mean, we can touch on it again. Um, what is the breeding biology of grass carp, and what exactly do they feed on? Well, the um, all of the Asian carps have an, a similar and very interesting reproductive biology. Essentially, um, when they mature after several years, uh, they swim up large streams they spawn and then the eggs have to actually drift down the stream and remain in suspension until they hatch. And when they hatch, uh, they have to, the, the young have to uh, end up being uh, deposited in a wetland that is, has a, a lot of nutrients for them, uh, for them to survive and grow. Uh, and so that, uh, that length of time that it takes them to drift down the stream may be anywhere between 20 and 50 hours, and the length of time really depends on the water temperature that influences the hatching rate and uh, the, the, the flow rate of the stream. Uh, because of this um, relatively unique spawning biology, there's only a certain number of streams in, in the Great Lakes Basin that uh, could uh, potentially allow Asian carp spawning. And uh, Jen did show the map twice about the number of streams 
uh, in each one of the basins. So at least half of the streams that we 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 had sufficient data to assess the suitability of spawning were suitable. Uh, so they have this this unique spawning biology, and uh, that that uh, they could could carry out at least 50% of the streams in the Great Lakes that we we evaluated. Uh, the second part of the question was, what do they eat? Uh, yeah, so grass carp, um, sort of aptly named, eat vegetation. And uh, interestingly, I have a colleague in, in South Africa who actually works on aquatic vegetation. And he, he, he was studying a system, the, the aquatic vegetation system. And there was sort of a, a, a natural experiment occurred. Grass carp were introduced. And 13 of the 14 species of aquatic vegetation disappeared within three to five years. Uh, so it, it, this is probably the most direct example of the devastating effect that uh, grass carp can have on an, on an ecosystem. Thank you, Nick. Um, I just noticed another one that had come in through registration that kind of ties into that one. So I think I'll ask it to you next um, as well. And it is, are there any forms of aquatic emergent vegetation that Asian carp, well, grass carp do not prefer? Um, and are there plants that they will prioritize? Uh, well, yes. Uh, any any plants that um, are, are soft and leafy, uh, which is most aquatic plants, they tend not to like any plants that have silica in the leaves, like um, milfoil, particularly Eurasian milfoil. So if we think that that the Asian uh, grass carp are the solution to our invasive milfoil problem, they probably not. Uh, they also can't really access Phragmites, another invasive species, so they're not a solution to invasive Phragmites. Um, so those, you know, uh, so. Bit, just about any native species uh, that does not have silica in the leaves uh, would would likely be um, heavily impacted by grass carp. All right. Um, my next question is for Jeff. What policies are in place to prevent Asian carps from establishing? So we've been working for a number of years now um, with DFO as well as a number of our own policy pieces. Um, all four species of Asian carps are prohibited under the regulations that we have in Ontario, um, both under the uh, Federal Fisheries Act, the Aquatic Invasive Species Regulations, as well as under our own legislation, the Invasive Species Act. Um, uh, again, similar to the uh, Aquatic Invasive Species Regulations, the regulations of our act require that any carp be um, dead and eviscerated if it's going to be uh, possessed in Ontario. Um, as well, so then uh, the, the four Asian carps, as well as a number of other invasive species are a priority for our uh, conservation officers. Um, they're doing monitoring of live food fish retailers and wholesalers, as well as bait fish harvesters and retailers. Um, and uh, we, they're working with Canadian Border Services Agency to inspect live imports coming into Ontario. Um, as well, we're working with DFO on surveillance and response. As I mentioned, that you know, while DFO is doing, as Jen said in her presentation, um, a lot of the traditional methods of netting and electrofishing, we're concentrating on uh, uh, surveillance through environmental DNA. Um, and as well, we're working with our partners in the U.S. Um, uh, on uh, control of grass carp in Ohio, where those existing populations do exist, as well as participating in uh, policy discussions um, about uh, further prevention measures to prevent the other species from entering at the Chicago area waterways. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Um, the next question is for Ashley. Um, have you done any content specifically targeting messaging to youth anglers regarding Asian carps and other invasive species? And it actually, it's a two-part question. Um, and have you found that there's any resistance or adversity among anglers towards invasive species programs? I think you're muted, Ashley. <laughs> Thank you, sorry about that. Um, 
you know, when I am creating content, any of my fishing content is really generated at, you know, everyone. Uh, the nice thing about fishing is that it is accessible to everyone, regardless of age, gender. So um, I don't really think of it in terms of being specifically age targeted. Um, so hopefully that kind of answers the question. I just try to, um, you know, I've worked, as I've mentioned earlier, I've worked with the Invasive Species Center over the past couple of years to uh, do different messaging types, some video, um, some written social media. Um, I actually visited the Toronto Zoo exhibit myself. So I'm just trying different forms of media just to try and reach different people, start that conversation and uh, hopefully um, get help get the messaging out there. Thank you, Ashley. And sorry, I wanted to add one other note. Um, mm. In term, in regards to the last question, I was thinking specifically about Asian carp, which I haven't had experiences with. But um, in terms of invasive species in general, gobies and zebra mussels are certainly something that I've you know seen over the years, and the impacts have been massive. I know that's not the topic tonight, um, but you know it's just as important. Uh, these ones change the ecosystems and, you know, out compete with the native species. So I just wanted to mention that, um, that those have been my experiences, but thankfully not with Asian carp. Awesome. Um, this one, I'm going to say it's for Dave, but Nick might also be able to add to it. Um, and it is. How long would a fry reside in a river before entering the main lake? And what size of fish would be would we be looking for if angling? Um, and then there's a similar question about juveniles um, and if they've been found in live bait shops, notably around Lake Erie and what measures are in place to aid bait shop owners with identifying these fish. It's like a four uh, part uh, I'm happy for you to uh, answer with regards to the, the fry, Nick, if you'd like to. But my understanding with um, the bait shops though is no, there's not been, there have not been many, um, Asian carps detected in bait, but I, I, you know, obviously it's important to remain diligent and um, be aware of uh, what's what's in bait and never, you know, dump your bait back in the water, um, and um, you know, be aware of what you're using and, and where you're using it. So, um, and then you know, we use a, a variety of gear types to target the different um, life stages too. So we, you know, fry are in the rivers. Um, for a while, uh, free floating, and especially you know soon after the spawning event, as Nick mentioned, the uh, I think it was about 20 to, to 40 hours. But I will let him uh, update on that with, with regards to the hatching. So our our focus is getting in during high water events that trigger spawning and, and doing um, you know sampling for for larval fishes. Um, and then with regards to, to anglers, um, you know it's it, it's likely to be. Um, you know, juvenile uh, and to adult sized fishes that they're, they're going to be capturing. So, uh, unlikely to come across uh, larval and, and very small fish, but um, it's still, still, you know, it's important to be diligent and uh, try to recognize and, and learn to identify the species that are being captured. So, I will um, turn, turn it over to Nick if he has any more to add to the, the larval component. Yeah, sure. Uh, so the one thing I, I, I didn't mention when we were talking about the reproductive biology is that they likely spawn a little later than most fishes in Ontario. And that we would expect them to spawn probably from mid to late June to, into uh, early September, uh, which means that uh, you're going to be encountering larval fit. Well, I, I don't think anglers, like as Dave mentioned, anglers would really encounter larval fishes, but larval fishes will be in the water anywhere from early July to, to mid-September, but they do grow very quickly. So by the time the first winter uh, comes around, uh, they could be uh, anywhere from 15 to 25 centimeters. And uh, an important part of the, that observation is that they actually quickly outgrow the mouth size of most potential predators, right? So we think the solution is they're gonna be eaten up by predators well, it's, they grow very quickly and they are quickly too large to be eaten by our native predators. And I, just to briefly follow up on Dave's point about the, the bait, because of the time of year that they will actually be small, um, uh, there will be less harvesting at that, that point in the year. We, we know that 
um, throughout the Great Lakes Basin, there's active surveillance of, of bait tanks as well. And there was an earlier question about how can we prevent them from getting into smaller lakes? Well, bait would be probably the main way that they would be put into smaller lakes inadvertently uh, as, as part of uh, bait. But I, I think we're, we're doing a really good job of um, trying to minimize the risk through the bait pathway. Or can I just jump in there too, Rebecca, for a second? Yeah, I was going to ask so, if you had anything to add, Jeff. Yeah, yeah. so our conservation officers are uh, monitoring uh, bait shops. So they're looking both at uh, uh, the harvester, the wholesaler people, as well as the retailers. Um, and they have they have done uh, you know done sampling in their tanks, and they have gone into uh, bait shops to monitor for Asian carps, and uh, happy to report that they have uh, to date never found an Asian carp in uh, bait in commercial bait either in with a harvester or with or with re uh, retailers. Can I also uh, jump in just for a sec? Mm -hmm. So as a, a part of the partnership between. OFAH and MNRF, we also deliver HACCP, which is the Hazard Analysis and Critical Control Point Program. So we typically co-present to new uh, licensees, uh, so bait harvesters, and they actually have to go through training for AIS, and part of that is actually Asian carps. So they learn about how to identify and obviously all the uh, hazards that would come along with those, so, so that they're not passing them potentially someday along to anglers. Awesome. Thank you, Brooke. Um, next question is for Dave. Um, it's kind of like a two-part question. How many electrofishing boats do you have, um, and how do you go about selecting the sites that you electrofish? Uh, okay, thank you. Yeah, we have. Let's see, we have uh, four electrofishing boats. Um, we have built custom boats actually where we can uh, do a combination of um, trail netting and electrofishing over the same vessel. So we've found combining gear types has actually been the, the most successful way for capturing adult grass curve. Um, and, sort of, and how do we determine where we go? Is that the next one or where we use those? Yeah. Um, yeah. So. It really depends on uh, the habitat where we're sampling um, and river conditions. Um, is electrofishing is generally, boat electrofishing is generally good to about three meters of depth. You can pull fish up from there. Um, and it's a lot better in, uh, well, it works well in complex habitats and, and simple habitats too. So we do a variety of uh, set nets. In, in, as well as active sampling with electrofishing. So again, it, uh, we're trying to cover all manner of habitats while we're out there in those early detection locations so that we're covering off um, you know, the, the full fish community while we're out there because that's what we want to see what the fish community is like out there now too and be able to target all the, the life stages of Asian carp. So um, yeah, it's just, it depends again on uh, flow and what gears work best in heavy flow, what gears work better in deeper waters versus shallow waters, or what gears work in uh, high vegetation, um, and what you know gears can't go where there's a lot of vegetation. So it's really dependent on the um, the area that we're sampling, which gears we select to use. And as I mentioned um, earlier and was talked about in the, the presentation uh, with Jen, is um, you know we did use modeling to determine the highest priority areas to go to in the first place as well. So we focus our efforts on particular rivers and uh, wetlands, and then uh, within that, we select what gears we're going to use in those spots. So um, I think, I hope that covers it. I think so. Yeah. Uh, thank you. The next question is for Greg. Does DFO do any inspections of ship ballast holding tanks entering Canadian waters? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, sorry, I turned my webcam off. It was uh, freezing up on me there. But um, okay. uh, ballast, uh, ballast water inspections, uh, that's under Transport Canada. So uh, over a certain size, fishery officers aren't actually inspecting the ballast water. Um, but that's something that Transport Canada does look at. Awesome. Thank you. 
The next question is for Brooke. Um, if you're angling, what is the best way you might hook up an Asian carp? Which I think would have multiple answers <laughs> depending on the species. Uh, yeah, um, it's a tough question to answer, right? Because you know Nick did a good job, and, and same with Jen, highlighting their diets and the very very specific diets. And I think if you were to capture one of these species, it would most likely just be an incidental catch, uh, potentially a snag. Um, I know a few years back, 2016, we had a, a gentleman call the Baiting Species Hotline reporting a capture of, a, of a, suspe a suspected grass carp, and it was actually a snag. He, he snagged it in the dorsal fin and was actually able to, to reel it in uh, and, and snap a photo with it. So that was a, a confirmed grass carp report that was then passed on to the Department of Fisheries and Oceans and the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. And they did go into the incident command structure at that point, and they were actually able to, to remove that fish from the water. Uh, Dave, I actually believe you were there uh, for, that, for that capture, as well as the other captures in that water body. Um, but yeah, so it, it's a it's a challenging one. You know, I have seen some some videos online of folks using things that kind of mimic uh, plankton to to capture something like the silver carp and bakehead carp. But you know, it, it's not something that you you're going to try to target, right? Uh, these aren't going to be your 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 future fish that you're going to want to recreate for. They're not going to be your walleye, your bass, your musky, your your pike. Um, they're just not going to replace those fish in our water bodies. So. You know, they're going to be very hard to capture. Thank you. Uh, the next question is for Nick. Are there any chemical solutions to prevent carp from spreading similar to what has been done with sea lamprey? Unfortunately, not yet. Uh, because sea lamprey is such a primitive fish, we were able to develop a, a specific uh, chemical that would kill primarily sea lamprey to the exclusion of other fishes that um, uh, other native species that we did not want to kill. Uh, we have not come across a chemical that is Asian carp specific, uh, largely because they're closely related to many of our, our um, native species, it, uh, in particular the minnows and the suckers. Uh, we are looking at other means to uh, try to control their spread. Uh, um, an obvious one to prevent them from migrating upstream to spawn would be to put dams in to prevent them from doing that. But at the same time, we were affecting native species that are using those same streams to spawn. So those dams are not ideal. There's the potential for putting up temporary dams during their spawning season, which I suggested is a little later than most species and earlier than the fall salmon runs. Um, there is the potential for using also non, what we call non-physical barriers. So using light or sound or carbon dioxide. And my lab is currently conducting lab and field experiments to determine how effective those are at, uh, th those potential um, mechanisms are at preventing uh, uh, Asian carp movement. And we're using common carp as the surrogate. Our concern about those, those means is they too will not be specific to Asian carps and, and would prevent the movement of all species. So we have not come across the silver bullet yet to uh, prevent Asian carp uh, spread. Awesome. Um, the next question is, this might, um, this is kind of for Dave and, and probably a little bit for Jeff. Um, where are you currently, I guess, finding them in Canadian waters? if at all, like when, when we have, um, and are there any DNA hits from Rondo, Lake St. Clair, or the, the Thames River? Or captures? I don't know if Dave wants, or Jeff, whoever wants to go first. Do you want to start, Dave, or do you want me to? Uh, you can go ahead, Jeff, and speak to the eDNA. Sure. Okay, so um, for eDNA, um, the hits that we have gotten primarily have been in, we've had some in the Thames, uh, we've had some at uh, the Grand River. Uh, primarily it's been in the in Lake Erie, uh, in the Lake Erie watershed, but it, some of it has been in Lake St. Clair as well. Um, those have been the eDNA hits. Um, and Dave, maybe I'll let you to, uh, take care of uh, where we've caught natural fish. 
Yeah, of course. Um, so as uh, Jen mentioned in the presentation as well, since uh, uh, the program, our, our program began in 2013, um, there have been uh, a couple of fish caught in uh, Lower Lake Huron and, and commercial nets through the, the Purdy fishery. Um, uh, there's been uh, several fish in Lake Erie and a few in Lake Ontario as well. So um, again, as Jeff was mentioning, primarily um, Lake Erie is, is our you know highest concern, um, but you know we're aware of uh, spawning populations in the Sandusky River as well as Maumee River. Um, so that western basin of uh, Lake Erie is is definitely a priority area for us to be out to conducting our surveillance and looking for any straying individuals coming into Canadian waters. Thank you. Uh, the next one I'm going to give to Nick because I think you touched on it a little bit already, but uh, it is, do otters or raptors have any predatory use against Asian carps? Uh, interesting question. I, I think the uh, issue will be that they get too big too quickly uh, to be effectively predated on by no, non-fish predators. All right. Uh, thank you. The next question I'm going to give to, to Dave, and it's one that we see very often, it's can you eat them? Uh, I don't know why I'm getting this one, but uh, hey. Um, yeah, yeah they, they can be eaten. I mean, they um, certainly are. There's commercial fisheries for them in the uh, Mississippi. Uh, you know, that being said, um, you know, our, uh, the fisheries that we have existing in the Great Lakes, we have much better food fishes available, um, higher quality um, flesh on the fish, larger, you know, boneless fillets on our, you know, walleyes and uh, yellow perch and things like that. So um, there are certainly, you know, fishes that we should be protecting and uh, enjoying way ahead of uh, Asian carp. So, you know, that's, that's my two cents. Um, I can't really speak to their flavor from experience. Um, I have a feeling Nick has tried uh, Asian carp of some sort or another, but I might just be throwing him under the bus here and it uh, might be untrue. But uh, I don't know if anybody else has. So um, personally, I, I can't say um, how they affected my palate, but maybe somebody else can. Well, I did eat them in Siberia and uh, grass carp and, and they were they were okay, but I agree with Dave. Uh, I'd rather eat a walleye or yellow perch any day, and um, that would the, that would be the choice we're making if we were allowed to we allowed grass carp to expand in the Great Lakes, either or, because we know that they would impact walleye and yellow perch populations. Okay, uh, the next question is I'm going to give it to Jeff. Has there been any discussion about classifying them as a coarse fish and allowing a bow fishing season if they were to establish? Yeah, we uh, there there really hasn't been discussion to date um, about what we would do. And right now, there is there's such a small number in Ontario waters that uh, we're still uh, like DFO looking at this as a as an opportunity to. Um, to try to keep the population out of Ontario waters, or at least at a, at a, at a complete minimum. Um, so we haven't had those discussions yet. Um, you know, should they become established in Ontario waters, um, I think it would probably be something that we would have to look at um, in terms of allowing something like we do, like a bow fishing season, like we do for common carp. But at this point, I, I don't think that's warranted to be looking at that yet. You know, and I guess the second part of that is, you know, typically um, until something becomes well established, you know, we really don't want to create a sport fishery for it because then there also can become a demand for it of, of you know, you need to manage this for sustainability and people want to fish for them. And similarly, that's how we view commercial fisheries. We don't like to commercialize um, invasive species because we don't uh, we don't want there to be a demand for that species. And, and thus, you know, if we ever found a way to um, eradicate a, an established species, we wouldn't want that to become controversial because you're going to ruin somebody's livelihood who has established a commercial fishery for that species. 
Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Jeff. The next question is for Ashley, and it is, what is your favorite species to angle for, and how might that be impacted by a grass carp invasion? Uh, that is a great question, and I turned my mic on this time. <laughs> Um, I have a lot of favorites, walleye, largemouth, smallmouth bass, lake trout, northern pike, panfish, muskie, the list goes on. Um, to be honest, grass carp would have serious impacts to all of the above because all these species depend on wetlands uh, for habitat, spawning sites, and nursery grounds. So, you know, grass carp would have you know, my opinion, devastating impacts and consequences on all of these fish. So um, yeah, that's my answer. Thank you. The next one is for Brooke, um, which we have covered, but it's good to reiterate. Um, if you catch a goby, for example, fishing regulations say you should destroy it. What do you do if you catch a grass carp? Uh, yeah, so you are correct. If you catch a round goby, you are to destroy it. You're not to return it to the water. Um, with grass carp, you know, I, I think Jen did a good job uh, really reiterating, and I'm going to reiterate that the first thing you need to do is be confident of your identification, right? And there's a lot of resources out there that can help folks to, to learn those skills. So if you can learn how to identify a grass carp and differentiate that from some of the, the, the commonly misidentified sp species like common carp, uh, fall fish, you know, creek chub, uh, sucker species, et cetera, then you're on route to, to being more confident when the circumstance may arise that you, that you capture a grass carp. Um, in which case, you know, if you do capture one and you are confident uh, in your identification, uh, first of all, you should mark your location, take a photograph and call the invading species hotline at 1-800-563-7711. Alternatively, you can email info at invadingspecies.com or you can actually go on to www.eddmaps.org slash Ontario to report. Um, any of those avenues are, are good avenues. Um, you know, we're, I'm always checking uh, EdMaps after hours even, but just something for, for people to know is that the Invading Species Hotline is Monday to Friday, nine to five, except we do have extended hours during the summer uh, for this partnership. So specifically trying to you know, uh, catch those anglers on that Friday evening, Saturday, Sunday, who potentially are out on the water, think they captured a grass carp and want to call us. Uh, we do have the hotline available at that time as well. So again, you know, the biggest thing is learning to identify your fish, right? Um, like, like I said, we get all sorts of photos uh, sent into us and some are better than others. Um, I, I think the number one thing again, is just, you know, learn how to identify your fish. And then from there, Again, if you're, if you're very confident in your identification, don't release that fish, try to contact us. If you can't get a hold of us, as Jen said, you know, euthanize that fish, cooler, head above water, you know, no whacking of the head. We don't want uh, those otolith bones damaged so that DFO can, can do the work that they do, so. Awesome, thank you. Um, no the next question is to Jeff or Dave. Um, and there's another similar one on, that came in earlier, so I'm going to combine them. But it is: Are you aware aware of any indigenous communities doing early detection in the Great Lakes? Um, and then the second question to that, I lost where I put it, so we'll start with that one. Dave, I'm going to let you uh, answer this one because I'm not aware of any. Okay. Um, well, I will speak to um, uh, work that we do with the. Um, uh, Mississauga and uh, Magnetowan and the Magnetowan rivers. Um, so we do work with the Mississauga and Magnetowan First Nations there. They join us in our early detection surveillance. So there are uh, biologists and uh, technicians from um, the from the communities that join us in surveillance. So we are um, yeah trying to actively engage and and and. Of, um, community members join in the early detection surveillance and learning about the different gears that we're using and, and what we're doing while we're out there. Thank you. The second one I found, um, it was in general, how do the Indigenous people of the Great Lakes region feel about the threat of Asian carbs? Thank um, you. I'll, I'll continue for a second, if that's fine. Um, 
I do think the, the video right off that uh, Jen showed there, uh, you know, Francis Lavalley from the Nailwash First Nation, um, you know, did a great job of speaking to the risks that uh, Asian carp pose to, you know, in, Indigenous communities and, and you know, the, the um, services that the, the Great Lakes um, provide to them. So um, there are, you know, a lot of impacts that have been shown um, if, if these species are, are able to um, establish. And, um, and yeah, like I said, in our early detection surveillance, at the in Mississippi River and, and Magnetowan, um, with the indigenous communities there, you know it's obvious that uh, this threat is taken very seriously, um, and you know Asian carps are uh, are a significant threat. And, and you know, like I said, they're it's something that uh, is certainly a uh, concern. So Jeff, I don't know if you have anything you'd like to add, but um, sorry for steamrolling through. No, nope, that's quite all right, Dave. I think you pretty much covered it. Um, but all, all I would say to add to that is is that you know we we know that uh, num that most First Nation communities have very uh, close relationship with the land and that they greatly value uh, their, our native species. So I, I do believe that there is a lot of concern about uh, invasive species and Asian carps. Thank you, Dave and Jeff. Um... My next question is for Brooke. And are there any signs or like outreach materials at popular fishing locations that uh, go through the difference between Asian carp and common carp? Uh, yeah, so there's there's lots of resources. Um, as you mentioned, the, the fact sheet that we've developed collectively, Asian Carps Canada, we worked on developing that fact sheet. So um, that that is available. It, it is available for download through AsianCarp.ca as well as BaitingSpecies.com. Uh, as far as signage goes, I was out on Tuesday this week. Tuesday installing signs uh, in the Greater Toronto area at some popular boat launches um, for Asian carps. That signage itself uh, actually just highlights the four different species. It doesn't specifically show the differences between the Asian carps and uh, native lookalikes, but there are um, links or well I guess there's there's information on those signs which will direct you to where you can find that information so there's lots of resources out there so you know if you're interested in finding some just invadingspecies.com asiancarp.ca those are two great great places to start thank you Brooke um, and I think I'm gonna just end off here with one more question um, for Nick and that is what is the probability of Asian carps establishing in the Great Lakes? Well, we've actually done uh, binational risk assessments that look at the actual probability. Uh, the We did risk assessments for big head and silver carp that were published in 2012. Uh, and uh, again, it was binational. So uh, both federal governments participated in this risk assessment. The probability of establishment of those two species was is basically very high throughout the basin. The only variation we'll see is the amount of time it takes for them to become established once they get introduced into the basin. So for, for silver and big head carps, we don't know of any reproducing populations in the basin yet, but once they're uh, introduced, uh, they will quickly they will spread relatively quickly uh, through Lake Erie, Lake Michigan, and Lake Huron, and then over a slightly longer period of time into Lake Superior and Lake Ontario, uh, because of some of the the barriers between the the lakes, like uh, the Welland Canal or Niagara Falls. Uh, but the the probability of of establishment for each lake is very high, but over varying lengths of time. In terms of grass carp, it, it is already established in Lake Erie. Um, and uh, the probability of establishment in the, in the other Great Lakes is also very high. And again, over an extended period of time. And that is based on a 2017 risk binational risk assessment that was um, completed by the two federal governments. So if they get into the Great Lakes, they will become established, uh, is the take-home message. 
All right. So um, just in the interest of time, I think we'll wrap up there. So if there are any questions that I that I missed or I wasn't able to get to, um, here is my contact information. You can send me an email. Um, I will go through the questions at the end in, in my report and see if there's any I missed and I'll follow up with you. Um, but thank you so much to everyone for, for tuning in tonight and thank you to Jen for presenting and everyone on the panel for participating. Um, I think it was really informative and I hope that everyone learned a lot. So uh, yeah, just a reminder to fill out that survey if you if you don't have, if you don't mind, if you have a couple minutes, uh, we really appreciate all the information and feedback you can provide and there is an opportunity for us to send you a swag bag. So if you're interested, fill it out, give us your mailing address and uh, and we'll get you some cool Asian carp resources. So thank you again, everyone. Uh, enjoy the rest of your evening and take care. Thanks everybody. Hey, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, guys.